Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless a pentagon funded non-profit is reviewing plans that could lead to our to feeding our troops lab grown meat instead of traditional beef they say it would reduce the military's carbon footprint lucas tomlinson joins me lucas <laughs> tell me I'm intrigued. What are the cattle farmers saying about this? Well, Stuart, cattlemen are not happy about this. It's how they earn a living. The issue entered the political arena when Governor Ron DeSantis banned the sale of lab-grown meat in the state of Florida. These will be people who will lecture the rest of us about things like global warming. They will say that, you know, you can't drive a, a internal combustion engine vehicle. They'll say that agriculture is bad. Meanwhile, they're flying to Davos in their private jets. Dory asked about the cattle ranchers. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association says, quote, it is outrageous that the Department of Defense is spending millions of taxpayer dollars to feed our heroes like lab rats. DeSantis has some support from Democrats across the aisle, like Senator John Fetterman, who says, quote, as some dude who had never served that slop to my kids, I stand with our American ranchers and farmers. Now, critics say lab-grown meat has not been vetted and is harmful, harmful to the environment. They put it in a stainless steel bioreactor, pump it full of chemicals and hormones to get it to replicate, and then pull out a meatball and call it lab-grown meat. There's no long-term health studies on this stuff. Lab-grown meat, according to UC Davis, may be 25 times worse for emissions than actual natural farm-raised beef. Now, defenders of this lab-grown meat say millions of animals would be saved by switching to this new diet. So that requires all this land and all this water and all this energy and all these resources. The idea with cultivated meat is ultimately you can make meat for people, real, clean, safe, healthy meat, without using a third of our planet and all these animals to do it. What does it say about the direction of the military and the treatment of those people who serve and sacrifice by these misguided, misdirected left-wing nuts, that this would be the focus, that to quote Joe Biden, that the great, greatest existential threat is climate change, that they would subject our heroes to this garbage. Well, I guess it's not so surprising that Iran is days away from a nuke and that Putin and Kim Jong-un just got an apartment together. I mean, these are the priorities. They look at all of us like we're lab-grown creatures. There's no, they have no connection to something being greater than themselves. And so they think if you're about to send men into to combat where they have a 30% chance of coming back alive, that at least they can keep their chins held high because no animals were harmed in the making of our MRE. This is maybe the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And absolutely none of it may, does anything to make our military more lethal, which, uh, as last I heard, is the only point of having a Department of Defense. And it just seems so odd to me that we're, we're looking at the military as, as a cohort and we're deciding that the greatest existential threat is something that will impact us in 15 years or 20 years with climate change. There are real threats today. The New World Order masters are replacing our God-given food with lab-grown monstrosities. So what's on the menu in the kingdom of Antichrist? Lab-grown chicken, steak, cricket flour, and all sorts of creepy crawling things. These meat in a test tube companies, like Upside Foods, are backed and funded by none other than Bill Gates. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created 
to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Bill Gates, under the influence of deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, is trying to destroy food which God declared good under the pretense of climate change. So far, the 2024 campaign has been simmering with anger and contempt. Everything Joe Biden touches turns to sh That other guy, that loser. The state of our politics inflamed, vulgar, antagonistic. Anger and outrage are biologically addictive. Jamie Schmelzer is not a mental health professional. Schmelzer sells sausage as a marketing executive for meat processing giant Johnsonville. We do not pretend that we have what it takes to save America. We know the world is full of serious problems that sausage can't solve. We couldn't keep up. But Schmelzer and Johnsonville believe they're on to something. What if instead of keeping it angsty, we all keep it juicy? The company's new ad campaign begs Americans to turn down the temperature, to find common ground and chill. Kiss outrage goodbye. Say hello to more outreach. Is this campaign political? We think this campaign is cultural, more than political, but we also fully recognize that those two things have become kind of inseparable. Johnsonville had a hunch the country was on edge. It took a stab at something politicians do, polling, and found that eight out of 10 Americans are exhausted by the anger and negativity in the country, and that many Americans are getting together less than they used to. Is isolation good for your product? No. So Johnsonville makes hangout food. We like to say that Sausage for One almost doesn't exist. And it's not just Johnsonville preaching calm and togetherness. That's right. That's right. That's right. It is both. It is both. You can find similar echoes in Miller Lite and Lazy Boy's ad campaigns. We're standing up for our right to be lazy. Selling less fighting and more relaxation. They're paying attention to our own thoughts as a society. Andrew Cohen is a cultural sociologist who specializes in advertising. It's a great place for these brands to play of saying, you know, we can't deny the reality that people are heated, that it's really hard to go to your family's cookout and not get in a fight with your uncle over some political views that you don't agree about. We can find common ground. We traveled to two battleground states, Georgia and Wisconsin, to show voters the ads and ask how they view the country. Everyone in the country feels a little on edge. Everybody's anxiety and emotions are high and we just need to chill. People seem to isolate themselves too much. Isolation, it's a bad thing, you know. That matches Johnsonville's research and recent warnings from the Surgeon General about the, quote, epidemic of loneliness and the toxicity of social media. It's a lot of drama everywhere. It is both. The advertisers hope that bridge building and slowing down is a message that sells to an anxious nation in short supply of unity. Laughter, our shared language again. It's kind of a pep talk for America to remember to just make time, take a break, and have some fun with some people that you like. When marketing wades into deep waters of national anxiety and estrangement, something has shifted something our summer of political strife is unlikely to settle. Spiritual warfare is off the charts. Battle lines are being drawn and people are choosing sides. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, climate change, gun rights, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. As we read in Matthew 12:25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus tells us he is the reason behind the division we are seeing today as we read in Luke 12, 51-53. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus then goes on to rebuke the multitudes for not knowing the time they were living in. 
as we read in Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Jesus now goes on to tell a parable about his true followers and those who are not, as we read in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus went on to explain the parable of the wheat and tares, as we read in Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those who genuinely follow Jesus are the wheat, and those who don't are the tares. The evil we are seeing today isn't Republican versus Democrat, right versus left. It's good versus evil. There are only two groups of people in this world, the saved and the unsaved. Here's a question everyone needs to answer. Whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or not affiliated with either party, do you love Jesus? Many professing Christians say they love Jesus, but in all actuality, they hate him. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Many who profess to be Christ followers are pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, and pro-transgender. They are defiant to the laws of God, as we read in 1 John, 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. How then can these people claim they love Jesus when he said, If you love me, keep my commandments? Jesus declares, They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, as we read in Matthew 15, 8 and 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For those who say Jesus never said anything about abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism being a sin, the Bible tells us all scripture is inspired by God as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Scripture has plenty of negative things to say about killing the innocent and homosexuality. It's called lawlessness. Many professing Christians justify sin by using Christ's commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the truth in love, not by condoning their sin. The good news is, God will forgive all sin, as we read in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, as a sign of His coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The Biden administration is calling it a breakthrough. After nearly nine months of war, U.S. officials say Hamas has softened its position, bringing them closer to a deal that could see the remaining hostages released and bring a measure of peace to the Gaza Strip. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu telling President Biden last night Israel will send negotiators to a fresh round of talks in Qatar. A senior administration official said Americans Hirsch Goldberg Pollen and Keith Siegel could be among the hostages released in the agreement's first phase. A hostage deal could also solve another vexing problem, the worsening war in Israel's north. Hezbollah, an Iran-backed group based in southern Lebanon, said it fired 200 rockets at northern Israel yesterday, calling it retaliation for Israel's killing of a top Hezbollah commander a day earlier. But even as Hamas negotiates on Gazan's behalf, there are growing signs it's losing their support. This woman has just seen the body of her slain son killed in an Israeli bombardment. I hope that God will destroy you, Hamas, like you destroyed our children, she yells. Dissent against Hamas's rule was once rare in the Gaza Strip, and it's still risky. But frustration is overflowing. This man, covered in blood, speaks to a stunned crowd. We have a filthy leadership, he said. They got used to our bloodshed. For many here, this is Hamas's war, and the Gazan people are their weapons. We refuse to continue the war over our kids' and women's bodies, said this opposition activist in Gaza. Today, Hamas has taken us 70 years back. Despite all that optimism from Washington, two Israeli officials told me this morning that this is not a breakthrough, that it's actually the beginning of a process that could last for several weeks. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Psalm 917 The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Hot and dry conditions fueling a wildfire emergency in the West. The French fire erupting in Central California near Yosemite National Park. Residents in the area forced to evacuate firefighters battling triple digit temperatures. Tonight, firefighters battling wildfires and scorching temperatures in Northern California. More than 1,000 people evacuating Mariposa, north of Fresno. The French fire temporarily shutting down a main highway into Yosemite National Park. Outside Sacramento, the Thompson Fire, now 46% contained after close to 30,000 evacuations, 25 structures destroyed. Fire officials say 17 fires are actively blazing across the Golden State. More than 145,000 acres burned so far this year, 17 times more than this time last year. 
Today is the day. It's the hottest day of the heat wave. A historic heat wave also searing the West. 158 million people under heat alerts. Death Valley could clock a scalding 129 degrees, just five degrees shy of the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth. Widespread flooding continues to inundate rural areas of northeastern Bangladesh. Tens of thousands are still stranded and in desperate need of fresh food and water. Ali Hussein, a poultry farmer, has five family members to support. He says he has not received any help from the authorities yet. Still in shock, he's not sure how he will cope. The flood has badly damaged most of my home. Many of our items were washed away by the water, and we are barely making ends meet. I have not seen floods like this in my lifetime. For some, just finding a green pasture for their livestock has become a major challenge. We are facing much hardship due to this flood and heavy rain. I have to look for grass all day for the few livestock that I have left. Bad weather has also impacted Bangladesh's southeast region. Many Rohingya refugees live in the foothills of a camp where heavy rains and landslides have been causing loss of life. Senwara Begum lost her 21-year-old son in a landslide. My son got stuck under the mud in a landslide. My daughter-in-law and I then tried to rescue him in the darkness, but it was too late. India's northeastern state of Meghalaya and Assam, bordering Bangladesh, have also experienced heavy rains and flooding in recent weeks. The Silet region of northeast Bangladesh, already devastated by last month's deluge, is now facing new flooding from heavy monsoon rain and upstream water from India, worsening the situation. Some environmental experts believe that the erratic rainfall is linked to climate change. Once the floods recede, for the rural farmers who have lost everything, it will take months, if not years, to rebuild their homes. They need all the assistance they can get, but for many, help is yet to come. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, 
Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Tonight we're learning that at least 20 people were shot on July 4th alone. Eight of them were killed. And this comes as many are trying to grapple with the lasting impact that gun violence can have on a community. Assassination days, babe. That's what Erica Pinkerton calls the July 4th holiday. She says she's trying to keep her spirits up after her friend, a 74 year old woman, was shot just this morning. They don't bother nobody. They're the sweetest ladies you would ever want to meet. She says her friend was one of the eight people who were shot in the Little Italy neighborhood Friday. Just hours after that shooting, six people were shot in Austin, adding to what has already been a violent week in Chicago. They got to stop the guns, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't go out at night, you know. You're afraid to go out at night because you're going to get shot or something. Von Bryan, executive director of the Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, says the violence is hurting local businesses. You can't complain that you don't have businesses or things that are going on when we're not keeping it safe in the areas for the businesses to thrive. At least 56 people have been shot and 10 killed since Wednesday evening, including three mass shootings. He has a gun. He kind of see him holding it up. Instead of looking at wedding photos, Yaribet Peña intensely stares at surveillance footage. Because one was shorter and one was taller. Our DJ was standing back here okay. when it happened, so he had a, a very good look. There are still remnants of a wedding ceremony. Such a high turned into an incredible low. She's distraught. She's depressed. She's just heartbroken. Friday evening, Dulce Emanuel Gonzalez tied the knot. After a decade together and two kids, this was meant to be a peak moment. I've always felt safe in our backyard. Fania lives right next door to her little sister Dulce in Dutchtown. The idea was to have an intimate celebration. We're just hanging out. Shortly after midnight, Fania said two armed men in mask walk through the gate. They just said don't move. As soon as he said that, I ran inside so I didn't witness when he got shot. I heard the gunshot when I was running through the house. Police say one of the men was going through people's pockets and the other armed man stood behind the groom. They were saying that my brother-in-law was going for his wallet and maybe they thought he was going for a weapon. He was shot in the head and the two armed men ran away. Here is ring door video of them taking off. The groom, 32-year-old Manuel Gonzalez, is now in the hospital. He's in critical condition. He's fighting for his life. Um, I'm just hoping that he pulls through. Benya begs for a break in the case for the bride. I would like for the community to help us locate these sus suspects. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. 
All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.